1986, James McGill Buchanan was awarded the Alfred Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. He was recognized for his work in developing a theoretical framework that extends the tools of economic analysis into examining how political decisions are made. This work has come to be known as the Public Choice School of Economic Theory. Public Choice Theory, as pioneered by James Buchanan, provides a deeper understanding of how government policy is affected by the self-interest of politicians and other political and economic forces. In a way, his interest in in both economics and, and political science are, are quite fitting. The son of Scotch-Irish parents, James Buchanan, grew up on a large farm in a rural and, and agricultural area of Tennessee, very, very near the site of a pivotal conflict in the American Civil War, the Battle of Stones River. Although poor, his family had considerable status in their small community, largely because his grandfather had served as governor of the state of Tennessee. The family expected that young James would follow his grandfather's example. I was groomed to be a lawyer. In sense, I was groomed first to be a politician, to follow in my grandfather's footsteps. But the Depression altered those plans. As Vanderbilt University became too expensive, for a family of limited means. Instead, Buchanan attended Middle Tennessee State Teachers College, largely because it was nearby and allowed him to live at home, where he could earn money for fees and books by milking dairy cows. Buchanan wasted no time in distinguishing himself as one of the finest students at the college. And after receiving his bachelor's degree in 1940, he was given a scholarship to the University of Tennessee for a year of graduate study in economics. Received a Master of Sciences degree in 1941. Plans to continue his graduate training at Columbia University were cut short by the prospects of the military draft. In August of 1941, Buchanan volunteered for service in the U.S. Navy and served four years at Pacific Fleet Headquarters in Pearl Harbor and Guam. In 1945, he faced what he later called his only real career choice, whether to stay in the military as he was urged by his superiors, or leave it for further academic training. 
Intrigued by the exciting intellectual climate he had heard about at the University of Chicago, Buchanan left what had been a very satisfying service in the military and embarked for his Ph.D. studies in economics in the Midwest. While at the University of Chicago, he met Frank Knight, the famed economist, who was to be his greatest teacher and mentor. In Knight's Price Theory class, Buchanan was converted from his early belief in populist and socialist ideas. He became, as he later called it, a zealous advocate of the market order. Since then, James Buchanan has devoted his life to studying the fundamental structures of political and economic decision making. Through such work, says his classic, The Calculus of Consent, written in collaboration with Gordon Tullock. The Limits of Liberty, published in 1975. To the power to tax and the reason of rules, both written with Jeffrey Brennan. Buchanan has continued his push for new ways to approach these abiding questions. Liberty Fund invited Professor Buchanan to a conversation about his life and work with Jeffrey Brennan, his longtime associate, co-author, and close friend. Jeff Brennan is professor of economics at the Australian National University. In part one of this conversation, Buchanan discussed the theory of public choice, his exchange theory of economics, and constitutional thought. In this program, which is part two of the conversation, Buchanan turns to such Topics as the work ethic, the logic of free markets, subjectivism, anarchy, federalism, the Nobel Prize in economics, and Buchanan's personal experiences and philosophy. We welcome you to a conversation with Professor James Buchanan. Let's talk about the work ethic. Um, okay. have uh, uh, unusual work habits yourself, I would say. I mean, a typical day, well, yeah. you, you, yeah. You, you correct me, this sort of may, uh, uh, may be a diff bit different now, but when I was in the Public Choice Centre with you, uh, you would go in mm -hmm. about six in the morning, mm -hmm. and you'd work till about five thirty mm -hmm. in the afternoon. 
and you do that on Saturdays, and you'd work at least half a day on Sundays, um, and you've done that for most of your career. Uh, and that was catching, actually. I mean, other people in the centre uh, 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 that. Um, and in recent past, you've tried to give an articulation of both of your own attitude on, on this and of how one might ground mm -hmm. that normatively might make mm -hmm. a general argument in favour of mm -hmm. the work ethic. Mm -hmm. as, as far as the more, the more recent type of, of stuff on the, on the work, work ethic, I um, became convinced that uh, um, somehow or another, uh, if if I work harder, that has to provide a benefit for in general. That is, right. that is, we're in a better world where people work hard. But now you go back to your uh, neoclassical models, uh, the idealized, competitive, stylized models. Right. Um, you can't generate that result. Right. I, I felt there was more to it than that. So maybe there's something wrong with basic economic theory. And this is one, one thing I think go back, back to our earlier points about Frank Knight. One thing you, you learn from Frank Knight is you accept no, no authority. Right. Absolutely no authority. That's right. what you, you learn from him. You can tackle anything. Right. And, and there's nothing sacred about, about received economic theory or anything else and so, so maybe something was wrong with it and and so then I had to go back to the, these uh, um, models that I had always rejected just based on teaching of Frank Knight and others always accepted the neoclassical paradigm and uh, uh, I have to go, go back and, and, and throw out the, the um, um, con constant returns models. Right. And you introduce the increasing returns models, so the work ethic stuff falls out very oh, easily. If, if you, uh, uh, so I go back and and trace out the pe people who have been dissidents from the mainline tradition in economics. Going back to Alan Young's, well, Adam Smith's a little bit, Marshall a little bit. But then, well, Adam Smith's whole, whole thing about, about uh, 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 division Division of labor depends on the extent of the market. Yes. The division of labor is what drives uh, uh, productivity. So the bigger the market, the more specialization, the more you can get. So it's an increasing right. return model. Marshall picked it up a little in the external economy stuff. And then Alan Young wrote this. It's a very confusing piece, but right. a very seminal piece. Uh, increasing returns in economic progress and economic 
in 1928. And Caldor and a few, a few others were uh, descending all along from the sure. neoclassical paradigm on these grounds. And so there was a, a sort of a dissident strand. Right. And p picking that up and saying, well, well in, 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 for the, the whole economy, the bigger the economy, the more division of labor, or the more specialization. So therefore, you, you can um, 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 uh, get a bigger bang for the buck, so to speak, right. bigger uh, output for in input. Then you come, come right back, back down to it. If you, you work an extra hour, that the economy is bigger. Right. The whole economy is bigger. So there's some specialization out there that can be picked up that could not have been picked up before. But what's interesting about that, that think of it that way and think, think of it in terms strictly of the Adam Smith model. Right. Division of labor extended market. That gives you, and, and I used it, and, and I came at it from a point of view of trying to argue that there is economic content in the work ethic. Right. Um, but, but you can look at it from the point of view of how, how do you defend and open markets. Right. How do you defend a free international market? How do you right. defend an open market? Well, clearly, if you open your markets, you are allowing for more specialization. Right. Uh, uh, take, I used to use the example of the United States market versus and, and Sri Lanka, one right. a little small market, another a big market. Right. Suppose Sri Lanka all, all of a sudden had protected its markets, not, not allowed any, any foreign trade. Sure. All of a sudden, it opens up. It becomes all the specialization of the United States and, and Sri Lanka. It wouldn't help the United States. States much, but it right. would be a tremendous boon to Sri Lanka. Right. So the argument for opening markets is essentially based on, on the increasing, the increasing returns. returns. One other distinctive feature of your work is the subjectivism. Um, I guess well, we said earlier, you, you know, that the, the cost and choice book, which is perhaps your most, art, you know, sort of extended articulation of a subjectivist position, grew out, out of the public debt book in a way. But, but um, uh, I've, I, that's a, an aspect of your work that I've always been a bit puzzled about. I mean, is, is that something that was heavily influenced by, by Hayek and Mises? That I came through independently. Although I was influenced a lot by uh, going back and rereading Hayek, uh, who reinforced my view, right, right. more Hayek than Mises. Mises right. was 
but not so strong as objectivist as, right. as Hayek. And right. Hayek's uh, subjectivism uh, very important. But actually, I, I was influenced on, on that in, in the public debt book. I talked about the burden of debt right. Right. and about how it was passed on, on to future generations. So well, that had to be individuals bearing the burden of paying for the expenditure that was made. Right. Individual tax, taxpayers. So that was the burden. That was the cost. Well, I, I didn't really realize in bringing that down to the individual level, I had to, to get away from the, the sort of standard model of, right. of, of thinking in, in terms of quantitative aggregate. It had to be subjective. Objective utility flows, right, and then, then uh, reacting to the criticisms of that book, and particularly in talking a lot with Jack Wiseman. Jack right. Wiseman was right. very influential on my in my thinking on this. Right. Uh, I, I came to the view that more and more, more that Really, the only entities that matter for choices are utility flows, pluses and minuses. Uh, and, and and that led me back into the uh, subjective literature. Now, I was in fact. Um, sympathetic to that because Frank Knight himself uh, sort of urged over into that. Right. He had a review of Vic Steed's book right. Right. In, in which he, he uh, uh, um, almost bought into that. that. Right. Rick Steed was, was, a, was a kind of a subjective analyst. Yes. In, and and uh, he almost, but he never quite got away from the standard equilibrium models, and neither have I. Right. And one, one reason that I've been able to to, to uh, um, uh, uh, go forward a little bit uh, and still be a subjectivist is, is I haven't bought fully into it. Right. Jack Wiseman and George Shackle, for yes. example, yes. Very good. they were frustrated. Yes. They, they, they just sort of became, and, yes. and Lockman even more. They right. just sort of threw up their hands. <laughs> Once right. you're yes. a full-fledged full subjectivist, you can't, can't say, say anything. Yeah. And so I, I've been able to Sort of say something, and yet at the same time be completely sympathetic to to their, their view. Right. right. And, and what I did in that little book on, on cost and choice was just take a very simple opportunity cost notion. What does it really mean, right. and what are some of the implications? And it's an important book too. I think uh, uh, because, well, for example, so much of this marginal cost pricing stuff and so on is coming back now uh, with deregulated industries, electricity, and so on. Uh, and the subjectivist uh, element is, uh, you know, not. Not too, too conspicuous there, there, I guess. Well, Steve Littlechild is another example of, mm. uh, of, of one who's been able to marry both, both of these. Yes. He's, he's like me, in, in a sense. Yes. He's, he's a very 
strong subjectivist. He and Jack were going to write this book together on subjectivism. And then, lo and behold, Steve becomes the whole, whole czar of the whole electricity, uh, yeah. electricity yeah. industry in Britain as it deregulates for a decade. Uh, he was the electricity czar are uh, overruling de deregulation. Right. And so he, he had to talk objectively about rates. <laughs> <laughs> but yet he did it very successfully. Yes. Very successful. In explaining ideas, there are kind of, there's an internal and external dimension, I suppose. You know, a lot of, of what you've said about, about your own research program reflects the internal dimension and influences from particular scholars, uh, reading Vixel, serendipitous or not. Um, but of course there are also some external influences. And I want to pick up one example. I think, think this is an example of this in your own work, which is um, the stuff on anarchy. Because uh, it seemed to me that that uh, the work that you did in, in the 70s, leading up to the limits of liberty, uh, work with Winston Bush, uh, um, and, and the work with Nick de La Togla, uh, the, the book Academia and Anarchy, all, all sprung in a way from the experience of moving to UCLA, mm -hmm. California in the late mm -hmm. 60s mm -hmm. and so on. Um, I'd like you to talk a bit, if you would mind, about that experience and mm -hmm. then whether yeah. and to what extent yeah. it influenced you? Uh, no, that, that was a very important. Uh, the, the 1960s were very important to me, and, the, and they were traumatic to me because you see, the, the calculus of the consent and my, my work up to that time basically was written in, in a kind of a what we might call a hopeful, optimistic, yes. uh, uh, rose-colored picture of the processes of democracy, constitutional democracy. And we, we wrote the calculus of consent really uh, uh, sort of thinking that all we were doing was sort of taking James Madison in, in court ideas and putting them into modern terminology and modern welfare economics terms and spelling it out, sort of justifying, legitimizing in a certain sense the American structure. Um, and then the 1960s happened. Right. And uh, not only uh, within the academy where it was overt, but it, but elsewhere, and it seemed to me that a lot of these institutions of order that that I had sort of taken for granted were were stable turned out to be very fragile. Right. It seemed to me that the whole set of rules and institutions 
it was breaking down in a big, big, big way. And so I, I, I changed dramatically my, my outlook. My outlook turned from, from being extremely, not extremely, but sort of basically optimistic to one which I was very pessimistic. And, and I, I didn't see an outcome of the 60s. Uh, I thought things were going to get worse rather than better. Right. And uh, the, the wave of assassinations, the, the purchase of the presidency, the, the whole of the Vietnam War, all those things seemed to me that everything was breaking down. Right. Right. And, and um, what, what to do? Well, I, I went to California. It, it turned out to be a mistake. I, uh, I um, uh, um, uh, um, went there because we had a very good department of economics wow. and, and uh, didn't leave because of the department of economics. They stayed very good. But the reaction of the faculty and the administration in particular UCLA to some of the events in the late, late 60s just horrified me. I was, I was, I felt like everybody's crazy except the and me, you know, the old Quaker uh, sure. saying. And I wanted to get back to the, to, uh, somewhere else. And so I went back to BPI in the Virginia mountains because it was a, it was a, it was a retreat kind right. of, uh, uh, and I had, had no idea that, that we could develop anything there. It right. was just, just to get away from the chaos, which I, I saw breaking down all, all about me. So we went back to the VPI, and Charlie Getz had uh, had the idea of getting Gordon Tullock to come back. He'd already come back, uh, got me back there, had the idea of setting up the Center of Public Choice. We had a sympathetic administration. We had a, a very tough Administration on on the uh, uh, dissidents on the right. on the students the rioters who really cr cracked down on them. It, it was an orderly place, right. and, and uh, we we got a good, good physical location, uh, and, and so we just blossomed out, right. and as a as a as a center there, and, and public choice center sort of has started having visitors from all over the world to come come there. And you, you came, and, and others came, and then early on, before you came, we got uh, a young, young man out of um, Washington. University of St. Louis, a real Georgia redneck. His name was Winston Bush. And uh, he got interested in, in anarchy. And, and of course, that fit in with directly with what I experienced. The right. world seemed to be anarchist. And David Lotaglu and I had written this book about academia and anarchy, which is the academies are breaking down. Right. And so Bush was interested in 
in the formal properties of anarchy. So he, he was a mathematical economist, and so he was developing that. And he organized a seminar. We had, had a very, very exciting two or three years, years early 70s, in which we were really examining what would happen if the world did fall down totally in anarchy and how you could analyze it and, and, and this sort of thing. And so out of that came several books, including My Limits of Liberty, Tulloch's Social Dilemma, two little books that were the volumes of this seminar. And so that was a very, very exciting period. And then Turned out in the 70s, things turned around. They weren't nearly as bad as I had predicted. Right. You know, universities survived after all. Right. That was, was an exciting turn. The, the 60s and how it happened and how it affected me in, in terms of my work is, is, is a part of my, my story, I think. Yeah, in that connection, and perhaps it's worth mentioning, uh, um, about 1970, before, or just mm. say, when I got back from to Virginia from, from California, uh, I felt like uh, that. I I needed to write a testament or whatever. Right. I needed to write the Buchanan version of Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom or Hayek's uh, uh, Constitution of Liberty. Liberty. Uh, um, I needed, I was ready to write that book. Right. And so I actually started, I tried my best to write such a book. And, and I actually wrote an introductory chapter, had an outline or two, and so forth and so on. And I found, found like I, I found I couldn't write it. Mm. There was too, too much Frank Knight in me. I wasn't willing to be quite so specific as Friedman or Hayek could be about this is what we ought to do. Right. I mean, I, I was not willing to go that right. far in a normative sense. Right. Too much yet. This, you yes. know, yes. Right. and, and uh, so it was a failure, and, and um, I was floundering, really floundering, and that's when Winston Bush came along mm -hmm. and started concentrating on, on this formal analysis of anarchy, and that mm -hmm. provided me the lock in to write the limits of liberty. Which is not like those, those books at all. No. Uh, but no, no, was, in another word, it's sort of a substitute for that right. book that I didn't write. So right. Jim, as a southerner, uh, federalism must be kind of in your blood. But how important? important do you think a federal structure is for liberty um, and how important to, I want to ask, is the right to secede? Well, well I, 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 as you know, uh, the federalism as a sort of a Research program has 
has been a part of my general uh, research program throughout my, my career. Here. As a matter of fact, my dissertation was on yeah. fiscal federalism, and, and, and uh, I worked in that general area. You and I have worked on it together. Sure. And uh, I, I do think, think that the notion, especially if you have a large, large polity, that the uh, federalism is an absolutely uh, absolute requisite for, for uh, maintaining any, any sort of liberty, any sort of check on the power of central government has, has to be effective power in, at the level of the subordinate governments. Uh, this sort of divided sovereignty between the central government and the and the, the uh, 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 separate subordinate governments, uh, um, and ultimately, in some ultimate sense, I think the right to secede has to be a part of, of the structure. Otherwise, you don't really have that authority. I think in the American context, um, the founders surely had in mind that the separate states would have the right to secede. Uh, of course, Lincoln fought a war to, to prevent that, and, 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 and effectively after that, we have not had a genuine federal structure in the United States, despite the fact that we call it that. Uh, I, I think the, the more modern application of the federalist idea or federalism idea has been uh, the European community. Community right. and for um, at least a decade or more, I argued that um, uh, Europe had a genuine constitutional opportunity to to move into a really an effective federalism where they would. In fact, to have guaranteed integration in the markets, uh, free movement of goods, uh, capital, and uh, and resources, labor across the national lines, and yet at the same time, the separate uh, nation states could maintain their existence and. Could Compete one with another in terms of um, uh, 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 regulation and so forth and so on, with an implicit right to, to secede. Uh, um, unfortunately, it seemed to me that, that the way Europe did developed uh, that idea was not dominant. It, to me it was offset by two other ideas that are, are at the opposite extremes. Uh, one, the, the sort of residue of socialist ideas of Directing and regulating everything from Brussels, right. which seems to have become the dominant view. Right. The other is the more or less the Margaret Thatcher view that uh, no nation state gives up one whit of 
sovereignty to a uh, central authority, whereas the by, by far the best option would have been somewhere in between those two. One important aspect of, of the way in which federalism contributes to liberty is the capacity of people to move when mm -hmm. coercion becomes yeah. too great. Yeah. There is, of course, an important other way in which that, that can happen, a way in which uh, 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 America has figured over its history, and that is by, by being a place where people can go when coerced yeah. in their own domestic yeah. countries, yeah. and yeah. so yeah. floods of immigration. Yeah into America, uh, a testimony to mm. a kind of provision of liberty, and that's been mm. something in America from yeah. the outset. But that suggests that, that, as it were, open borders, mm. uh, uh, even without, as a where federal political structure, open borders between nation states, yeah. is an important element in minimising coercion. And I wonder whether you see uh, America, for example, Example as locating itself properly in that respect. I mean, in, in particular along the Mexican border. I mean, what's your view on how, how open the borders should be? That, that is a critical question as to what, what extent you can have of open borders. Um, uh, this gets in di directly into immigration type right. uh, policy. Um, and America, as you say, has been a, uh, a haven for people oppressed who, who felt they were oppressed who could move from, from uh, uh, take the exit option and move yeah. from countries where uh, they thought they, they were or their liberties were were at stake um, and, but then you've got such a disparity in in the economic development you've got, got economic reasons quite apart from, from freedom reasons Reasons from sure. liberty reasons for uh, for my migration. Uh, um, I think you, you can make an ar argument about from an economic point of view, from a classical liberal point of view, for, for allowing uh, open borders and free immigration. Provided you did, did not have, have a superimposed welfare state, exactly. But once you, you've got a superimposed welfare state in which people who can, can enter can immediately make claims against the tax-paying part of the population, then that. That changes the whole dynamic uh, of the immigration policy. One, one of the mysterious elements, at least to me, in your intellectual apparatus is this 
phrase is the relatively absolute absolute. Yeah. Um, partly because it seems to play a particularly dexterous role whenever mm. the arguments get mm. tough, you know. Mm. Um, so, so I wonder if you could t t try to explain to me um, again, again what uh, the concept of the relatively absolute absolute was designed to capture. Well, as, as I've told you and as I've told many, many people, uh, I couldn't live without the relatively absolute absolute. Right. Uh, it gets me out of a lot of jams. <laughs> as, as you say, it gets me off a lot of hooks too, <laughs> uh, but it's 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 a concept or a notion and a phrase that I picked up directly from, from Frank McKnight and Henry Simons, both my professors at the University of Chicago, who use this this term and. Um, I think it is very helpful in the sense that, that uh, um, it it prevents the necessity of ta taking a position either as, as a relativist in all respects right. or, or as an absolutist. Right. I I am neither. I'm right. neither a relativist nor an absolutist. It's right. an in-between position. You don't take, for example, take ordinary morals, for example. Right. I don't have to become an absolutist like Alan Bloom implied in the closing of the American mind. Say ultimately there are absolute values out there, and we just have to search for, for them. But I certainly don't have to take the view that, that everything is up for grabs. Everything is relative. Right. You t take the view that uh, um, there are, are some moral values that have been in existence a long time, that have been proved the test of history, uh, uh, that you could make an argument for, that it is best to live our ordinary lives by treating those as relatively absolute absolutes. Now, what you mean by that is they're relative in the sense that they're not beyond examination. Right. Nothing is sacrosanct. At one level of existence, you can evaluate those. You can say, well, are they really... Uh, So uh, uh, stable or or or, 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 or unchallengeable as 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 they might might seem. We can challenge them in the academy. That's the job of the academy is to do that uh, to challenge these basic values. But but at the same same time, that's not going out and saying just anything goes at all. So right. it, it gets you off that that terrible 
problem of, of becoming one or the other. Well, uh, there is uh, your current research, not yeah. the relevant, yeah. way, absolute, yeah. absolute, but the using the metaphor of the, the commons uh, uh, as a lens mm -hmm. in which to understand and political processes. Uh, um, perhaps you could tell us something about what that commons metaphor means mm -hmm. and, and the, then what, what, as you, you see it, the implications of this way of thinking about politics uh, Well, first of all, let me say this. I think that one thing that's been very, very helpful to me uh, is, is uh, Nietzsche's aphorism. Nietzsche is great for these aphorisms. And he, he, he talks about looking at the world through different windows. Yes. And I, I use that many, many occasions. Uh, it, it, it is it's useful and gets back to this relatively absolute, absolute in a way. It's useful because it suggests that you can look at the world through different perspectives and therefore you get different interpretations by looking at it through different perspectives. Right. But on the other hand, it's, there is a world. In other sure. words, there is a world you're looking at. Right. So you're, you're looking at a room through different windows, so to speak. Now, um, this uh, use of the commons metaphor applied to politics is simply looking at politics through a different window and therefore it's partially explanatory I think it seems to me that the standard conventional work orthodox work in public choice uh, um, our work uh, our joint work Work and, uh, and work I've done with others, uh, uh, as well as orthodox political science, has always started out looking at politics as a, a collective enterprise in which collective decisions are made, but they're made by a decision structure that is, in a sense, monolithic. Right. In other words, take majority governance. Sure. You, you have a majority coalition or a median voter or whatever. Sure. Once you make a decision, you make a decision. Um, sure. And uh, that's a monolithic structure of the decision. Uh, whereas the commons metaphor suggests that maybe a good part of politics is that, but there are other aspects of politics where, where there is, is not a single decision maker. Right. Where, where you have a different decision of authorities making decisions simultaneously. Right. And politics is that or I mean, a political result emerges from, from the action of those, those several authorities. Right. And that's where the metaphor for the commons comes in. And the commons 
goes back to the medieval notion right. of uh, where the peasants are all, all allowed to put their sheep on, on a common pasture. Right. Obviously, as each of them decides separately, right. uh, independently, uh, to put his sheep on the pasture, he will put his sheep on there as long, as long as he can do better than over the open range. As a result, you get the value of the pasture dissipated. And, the, the, and that has been picked up, up the standard in economics as long as it's a century old discussion in economics. Uh, but it's only been picked up the last 40 years or so uh, in applies to the environment, applies to water, air resources, and everything else. But looking at the government that way, you see, you, you come to the view that, look, uh, political outcomes are not Necessarily, the outcome is determined by a single decision-making right. group or, or, or a coalition. Right. You can have differing coalitions of making decisions that all of which produce political outcomes. Right. A good example, for example. Example: Suppose you have a rule or, or a setting in which uh, any majority can tap the general tax base. Right. After all, all the the potential okay. Okay. productive capacity of the economy is the tax. Tax base, yep. and so you have a rule or a setting in which any majority can, in fact, tap that tax base. So then you have an ideal sort of model of a of a sort of a commons thing, where you have differing coalitions deciding on imposing a general tax uh, um, to finance education, to finance highways, to finance this and that. Out of that emerges an outcome. But, but that outcome is not due to the one majority deciding multidimensionally uh, um, what is going to be be the total budget, and rather it's this group, this group, this group, out of which emerges uh, an outcome. And that's a rather different conceptual way right. to look at right. the whole political process right. uh, than in the normal way. And I do think it is explanatory for a good part of what we talk about as politics. I wanted to ask you some questions about your career generally now. Uh, um, and, and one aspect of that career, which is kind of notable for a person of your distinction is the fact that a very, very large proportion of your time has been spent in universities that are outside the United States yeah. academic Good. establishment. Yeah. Several questions about that. Then. I mean, that must clearly have been some sort of choice that you, you made. 
did. I mean, why, why did you choose to operate in the boondocks? Um, and do you think it had any effect on the sort of things you did or the sorts of things you were able to do? Well, I think, I think it is a very important aspect of my career. Uh, I, I'm not sure that um, your implication that I had the choice is quite <laughs> so strong as before. I, I, I suppose um, at certain stages I certainly could have, have gone to one of the more established institutions, especially as I develop my career develop, but I, I, I chose not to do that. And both in the education uh, earlier on, uh, uh, going through a little uh, Middle Tennessee State Teachers College, and then the University of Tennessee, then Chicago. Chicago was the only really good university right. by the standards of, of, of excellence that people would generally apply that I have been uh, associated with. And um, so uh, I think it has had an effect on me in the following sense, I think it, um, it, it has allowed me to uh, um, um, work somewhat more independently to, to, to uh, 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 develop my own ideas more rather than in a cocoon of of, of, of people who were so dominant that they would, in fact, have um, made it difficult for me to be as independent. Right. Uh, to, to, to give you an example of that, that I did have the opportunity to go back on the faculty. University of Chicago right. a few years after I left uh, there. Uh, um, and, and I'm very glad I didn't. Yeah. Uh, had I, I gone back there, I would, would have felt like I was dominated by the, the extreme intellectual uh, uh, Abilities and capacities of colleagues that I would have felt much more inhibited about going out in my own directions. Right. So I think I've had a good deal more, more liberty in, in in intellectual pursuits uh, by being a, a sort of uh, a big, big frog in little ponds, right. to use uh, Robert Frank's, Frank's term, right. rather than a little, little frog in a big pond. Right. I, I learned the hard way that uh, really my best performance as well as my contribution right. is higher if I, if I go to places that, that are in, in the boondocks. Right. I, I, I use the example of Chico State as a, a <laughs> university as, a, as uh -huh. an example, which I visited. I, I go back. back as a Nobel Prize winner, 
there and speak at those places. And I, I stay a few days and I meet a lot, a lot of faculty and a lot, a lot of students. And, and my, my line that I give them is uh, um, I come from a place just like, like this. Right. And if I, if I can get a Nobel Prize, you can get a Nobel Prize. Right. And yet it's amazing how that uh, uh, exhilarates the, the yeah. students and the faculty. Yeah. All of a sudden they begin to see a different right. possible future. Right. Right. In other words, I can right. tell them I'm one of you, you and they, right. they accept that. Whereas right. It doesn't matter in these other places. We've talk, talked a little bit about winning the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. and about what it meant to you in terms of busyness mm -hmm. and, and so on. But more generally, it must have been an, an enormous affirmation uh, uh, to you. Well, it was in. Uh, you said affirmation, it was kind of a vindication right. in a sense right. of the uh, uh, fact that what I had been working on was worth, worth, worth something to somebody. Right. And uh, as I've said elsewhere, and as other people have said, that it is just it is a tremendous event. And the sweet we uh, uh, do know, know how to put on a show, yeah. and that, that week, uh, Nobel week in Sweden is a fantastic week, and, and uh, 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 no one can quite experience anything like it unless you, you've actually been through it. And, and uh, of course, it. It elevates you to, to a different status in the yeah. eyes of, of many people. And go back to what we said earlier about me being an outsider. Right? The outsider comes inside Absolutely. almost by necessity. Do you think things like the Nobel Prize are a good idea? Yeah. I mean, it's an inside institution, that's why one might put it. Do you think it's, it's good that we have, have such things? Well, I, I think that um, prizes generally are, 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 are good. We, we don't quite have, have enough of them right. in, 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 in the academy. Uh, as Gordon Tullock, you know, has always, always argued that, and I think I, I agree with, with Gordon on that. I, I think uh, you can make a, an argument that the Nobel Prize in economics uh, it was not, not a good thing uh, um, in the sense that it was set up with the implications somehow that economics is a science right. analogous right. to the natural sciences. And it's not, but as Hayek pointed out in his Nobel Prize speech, uh, right. not at all. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, uh, having put e economics in the in the, the uh, uh, list, that's been very good for economics to have it in there. I, I think the the profession in itself has shaped up a lot, a lot because of the, yes. of the Nobel Prize. Well, I mean, you often say that. Uh, uh, not interested in saving the world. Yeah. 
Christ. Yeah. Uh, when I say I have very little interest in, in saving the world, I, I'm, I'm really picking up from uh, Frank Knight again, uh, who said that one of the uh, delusions of modern liberals is that somehow they feel obligated to feel they should contribute toward making the world a better place uh, by their standards. Sure. It seems to me that it is a delusion that uh, uh, they're likely to frustrate themselves that way and and uh, it seems to me that what Knight was saying and I share and was influenced a great deal by him in that, that respect is, is that what we're doing is is engaging in, in a way in a, in a kind of an ongoing Dialogue, an ongoing constitutional convention in which everybody is involved, so to speak, uh, um, in which we're trying to discuss uh, schemes and ways in which we can make the world better, but not as not as better by what I would like to see better, but rather out of a generalized discussion, something will emerge to make the world better. That's a totally different way of looking at it, I think. You once remarked to me, uh, uh, perhaps more, more than once, that uh, if you, you don't some days imagine you're a fraud, yeah, yeah. then you, you're sort of lacking in imagination. Yeah. 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 Um, this is a kind of comment about perhaps this goes back to relatively Absolute, yeah, yeah, absolute, yeah, in a way, yeah, yeah, yeah. but the significance of the yeah, yeah. academic enterprise yeah. and the, one's own work and so on, an issue perhaps of not taking it too seriously, yeah, yeah. but then on the other hand, having to take yeah, it yeah, seriously. Well, we, we have a... a, a a man that both of us knew, he's dead now, uh, Bob Staff, uh, he continually worried. He was an economist, had a PhD in economics, did economics faculty, but he continually worried about the fact that the only productive thing he, he thought he'd ever done was when he worked in his father's bicycle shop. <laughs> he simply couldn't, he couldn't justify his own existence as, as an academic economist or, or any other academic. Right. You sort of, uh, it, it, it's difficult to justify it. You can't see a product. You can't get your hands on something you're producing. You're right. producing students, maybe, and, and so forth and so on. And, but really, what can you, uh, what can you really say? You, you, you Publish something, but what impact does it have? Is yeah. it not that somehow society is just 
just uh, just funding us, and we're lucky, and we're, we're getting our, our rents and being happy about it. And why I worry about it, and most of us don't, don't even think about that. But if, if you force yourself to think, uh, well, uh, you you wonder sometimes the the payoff to to, to academic scholarship generally is 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 long long term. It's yeah. Very, very long long term, and you you got it. It's very tricky as you move into economics or philosophy and those. Those kind of things much more difficult than the sciences. The hard, hard sciences is ultimately maybe the spirit of science, and you're furthering somebody's going to make a new discovery, find out more, or, uh, some medical, uh, some discovery, or some physical discovery. But we. It's hard, hard to know with us because we, we have yeah. to kind of reinvent the world and, and propose th things and work on them and, and hope they have, have some impact. I remember you, you saying to me on one occasion that if you had been born in the UK, yeah. you'd have been a socialist. Yeah. Um, what did you mean by that? I mean, what, what, what was at stake in that judgment? Well, well I do think that there is a, even today, even at the turn of the century, there is a very, very substantial difference. Uh, among countries and among cultures, uh, in terms of, of uh, what we could call social mobility, right. and, and I do think that uh, still today, in Britain, as much more, more class-oriented society, I think it's much more, more difficult. To uh, for some, someone in the lower classes to working classes to move upward, to move upward mobility is less. I think that's true all over Europe, mm -hmm. and, and I think we're affected by our history. I think the American uh, history is is important in the sense that it's been more open, especially open to upward mobility. And I think that's one reason you have not had the, the sort of socialist movements in the United States it's nearly to the extent that you've had in Europe. I also think it's true in terms of the history that has to do with religion. Now, a good friend of mine, uh, Professor Francesco Forti in, in um, uh, Italy, has been a socialist all his life, uh, a leader in the Socialist Party before the Socialist Party broke up. Um, he says it in in America, he'd be a libertarian, free market oriented person. And I think he's right. right. Uh, traditionally, the socialist uh, and the uh, uh, um, party grew up there in, in part in opposition to, to the Catholic Church, the Don of the church. And so, uh, um, again, 
in its history. Uh, and, and I think that um, uh, history makes a difference. And I think growing up, up as a, a working class uh, or lower middle class person in, in the British situation, and I would have necessarily oriented myself toward the interest of that group. Uh, so there are differences. But what that suggests to me is that there, there are uh, forms of coercion to go back to your original claim about your antipathy to, uh, to, to governments and and, and support for free markets and so on. There are forms of coercion that don't lie in the power of the state directly. I think I would agree if I know, if I quite, if I understand what you're getting at. at they, there, there are means through uh, social structures and others in which you can uh, essentially have discriminatory treatment. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, and yet, in one sense, the market can be open. Yes. Uh, um, in Britain, for example, 50 years ago, Allowed to uh, apply for any job, but no working class boy with a Yorkshire accent could have got to, could have got that job. Right. Uh, 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 he'd been an Oxbridge boy if he, uh, you know, to get the job. And those are the kind of things you now admittedly. In a, in a kind of, a, uh, uh, if you, you look at a, uh, discrimination, look at this from a discrimination point of view. Admittedly, those who choose to exercise that discrimination are in fact paying for it. But people will pay for it sometimes. Sure. Uh, uh, people don't maximize net wealth in the purest sense. No. Uh, well, that brings me to a, a story about, about the United States, actually, which, yeah. uh, uh, which I want you to tell. Uh, um, this is the, the, the story about your experience in the war. Well, I, I've told this story about my own personal uh, 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 subject to discrimination against me because I was basically a southerner. Uh, uh, when I went in midshipman school, my draft number came up very early, and I, I went into officer's training. In the Navy, and um, we went to New York to officers training school, and, and uh, turned out that it just so happened about 600 of us in our group in our class, and it turns out so happened that most of us were, were from the South. In the West, right. uh, there were very, very few from the Eastern Upper Ivy League groups, right. Right. but we had to form up, up into uh, uh, com companies and platoons uh, uh, quite early on, on before 
we took any tests or anything else like that. And so, so they had to appoint a uh, um, you know, uh, midshipman officers for the companies in the platoons. Right. And we were organized in terms of alphabets, right. purely alphabetical. So the A's and B's were my group. But it turned out that we didn't have any uh, Yaleys or Harvard or Princeton people at all in our group. So, so uh, who are you going to appoint as cadet or midshipman officers? Well, down in the R's and the S's and the T's, they had too many uh, ah. those. Uh, so what, what they did was they took Bill Rockefeller, who was the cousin of Nelson's, and imported him over into our group to become our platoon leader. Right. And you can imagine how that went down with us. Right. It turned out 12 out of the 18 cadets, the midshipmen officers were from the Ivy League establishment universities, whereas the percentage in the uh, in the group would have been less than 10 percent. So uh, that was sort of overt discrimination. Right. You can imagine what that did to my, my communist <laughs> leanings at that time. I can't. And I mean, some of that residue has stayed with you, don't you think? I mean, uh, you, you, you've You've had a, a very mistrustful attitude towards the rich, which is unusual among libertarians. Mm -hmm. Not so much self made men uh, or women, mm -hmm. um, but much more. Second generation mm -hmm. wealthy mm -hmm. uh, family. So, so, for example, um, I don't know. You can usually be be, be uh, energized. Yeah. Let's yeah. put it by yeah. the, uh, by the Kennedys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean. Why? Why is is this, is this because it's the second generation in particular that uh, that you see as being the creation of class systems? Well, I will respond to that, but let me first go back to my other point about the, the Navy experience. Right. Uh, I can now understand. Now I'm sophisticated enough to understand statistical discrimination. Right. And, and I'm sure that, that it was perfectly rational for the Navy to pick, pick out right. and, and put as midshipmen officers the Ivy League boys because because on the average, they probably did better than than we did. So I, I can understand it, but right. I still didn't make it seem fair, fair to me. Right. Right. Now, to go back to your your basic question about, about uh, my 
position on on inherited wealth and, and on the rich in, in general. I do think there's a major distinction to, to be made between the, the the rich who make it on their own and those who pass it along. Right. And I've always been uh, uh, sort of congenitally in opposition to the, the uh, gross inequality of opportunity that is provided by uh, inherited wealth. Um, it seems to me to the extent possible if we're going to genuinely try to achieve a free society and a society in which people are free, uh, it, it, it does seem to me that we ought to try as best we can to uh, take whatever steps are necessary to generate equality of opportunity. Right. And I realize, full well realize, that you can never get there. Right. I full well realize that if uh, you don't allow inherited wealth, you would get, people would invest more in their education and training and culture. They're going to be inequalities and opportunities. No way you're going to eliminate it. But on the other hand, steps that you can take toward providing a quality of opportunity, it seems to me always is, is a good thing in the sense that, that it makes for a more uh, um, uh, society in which people have a sense that, that they're in a fair game. Yeah. Yeah. To me, the important criterion is are you in a fair game? Uh, and, and to me, it's not a fair game if you start or a fair race, if you start one somebody out with uh, 30 feet ahead of the, of the other person. Right. Uh, the starting point, starting gate. Right. And sometimes you even play by different rules. It seems to me you play, play a fair game has to consist of playing by the, the same rules and to the extent possible you, you start from the same position. Now, if roughly you do, do that, then, then you allow, allow people to go as far ahead as they can. I have absolutely no objection whatsoever to Bill Gates having everything right. that he can make. Right. Now, I do, do recognize of course, the, the incentive effects. I recognize yeah. that if, if you disallow people from uh, picking out and doing what they want, want to with their money, they're not going to earn as much, much money. They're not going to invest it as well and, and so forth. So it's not, not to, and I, I realize you're infringing on those per persons free freedom when you, you've coerced them into uh, 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 doing it in certain ways rather than others. And so it's, it's not the man who, who is giving the money away that I, I want to coerce. It's the man who's getting it. Right. Nobody has a right, right to it. Right. No Kennedy has a right, right to get $10 million dollars when he gets uh, whatever of age right. uh, as compared to 
and to the to the others. Uh, no matter what, what the, the old man might have might have earned. Right. So I've always been very much in favor of of trying to adjust to some extent on that score. You are though a bit drawn to the, the French existentialist position, mm -hmm. or at least mm -hmm. the idea you occasionally mm -hmm. say that, well, the whole game is absurd. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I take that that's a reference not just to academic mm -hmm. games, but mm -hmm. to, uh, but to the yeah. life yeah. Enterprise uh, totally taken. Uh, um, is that your view? I mean, that at an ultimate level, the whole, whole thing is well, well, let me, kind of absurd. But, but before I get to that, I will get to that. Go ahead. Let me go back, back to religion a little, little bit. I am a tremendous admirer of the Mormons. I know this. Yes. Uh, um, if I were to choose a religion and could jump in, into a religion right. and, and really be, be a believer, I would no doubt where, where I'd go. I'd right. be a Mormon tomorrow. Right. Right. Because I think the way they have, have organized and use their religion as a means of, of organizing their, their lives. I spent a five weeks standing at Brigham Young and saw them operate and you know, went to their homes and so forth. I have a tremendous admiration for right. what they're able to do. Right. And uh, so, I want to put in a plug for the more <laughs> um, but um, uh, um, now to go back to your, your existential yeah. question um, I was uh, influenced a lot by and, and think, think about it a lot by Camus yeah. yes. the myth of Sisyphus which right. is a wonderful book, I think. Right. Where, where he, 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 is, he is, what he's doing there is saying, look, let's try to organize our, our lives in such a way that even, even though it goes back to the relative, right. absolute, absolute, Surely. at one, one level, we sort of recognize Recognize it's all absurd. At uh -huh. another level, we got, got to keep the game interesting. We got uh -huh. to keep it such that it's worth playing. Right. We don't give up in despair. Right. So, so uh, uh, he, he was able to sit, sort of satisfy himself and. And sort of well, that's what I've tried to do in a, in a certain sense. You you, you want to make the game that, that you're in and you, um, interesting. You, you want to recognize, and the way you make it interesting is you set up your own, own counters and you sort of move, move toward, toward achieving a bit, bit here and there. Right. Make it an interesting game. Use the game analogy if you want right. to. At an another level, if you really force yourself back and really get into examining these deeper issues, these deeper questions, you, the, the, the whole thing may be absurd. Right? What is it all? about. Right. I mean, uh, uh, 
Um, to me, that, that's a fairly satisfactory position. Now, right. a lot of people jump off cliffs because they sure. can't, can't solve that problem. Sure. Well, I've been th thinking more and more about, about that. Now, now, this is something we have, have not talk, talked about. about. Why, why is it that I, I am interested in, in, in what's going to happen when I'm no longer around? Right. In my case, it can't be genetic. I don't have any children, sure. so it can't be genetic, which is popular now to call it genetic. It can't be that. But but yet I'm intensely interested in that. Right. Now, why is it I'm interested in it? Well, and why? I was Mr. Goodrich, for example, right. so interested in carrying forward liberty, uh, so forth. So well, it seems to me that, that, and this does get me a bit away from the methodological individualism point. A lot right. of stuff that, that's inherent in my position. Right. Um, it does seem to me that we, or at least I, uh, feel like, like I'm a kind of a member of a kind of a tribe. Right. right. What, what we might call a tri tribe that is. A continuing tribe, it doesn't die. It doesn't have, it may die, but it right. doesn't, it, it does beyond my mortality. Right. It, it's a kind of a tribe of, that would be called, described by the spirit of liberty or, or the spirit of classical liberty. And it seems to me as as a participant in that, that game, in that, that kind of furthering those ideas. And and I live as, as long as those, those ideas live, in a way. Uh, um, it, it, I'm just a part of a stream. Right. And in a sense, that, that stream is going on. on. Right. Now, it takes people to keep pushing and keep motivating that stream, right. or else the stream can die. It, right. It's not, not necessarily immortal. Sure. But on the other hand, it transcends human life. Uh, an ordinary way, and, and yet it makes me. It provides me meaning to uh, ordinary lives, and it seems to me the spirit of liberalism, the spirit of classical liberalism, or the spirit of liberty, if you want to put that, uh, uh, um, can be a, a kind. Kind of a justification that that, that um, sort of gets you away from, from this uh, ultimate absurdity in a way. Right. In a way, so maybe maybe I've moved, moved away from that. Right. I, I, and I've just been thinking about that fairly recently right. because I remember I'd, uh, the um, Betty Tillman had organized a luncheon meeting in honor of my 60th birthday. Right. For some uh, uh, 
21 years ago. And I talked a little bit about this, but I, I think I've articulated more fully now as to what I'm really thinking about. And I think it's worth thinking about a little 